first of all, I want to start at the beginning with regard to gamers and attackers and, and, and kind of get some clarity there around. Are gamers really dangerous or, or are dangerous people oftentimes gamers? I want to make sure I make the distinction there. That's a very important distinction to make because uh, we get asked this question a lot. Gamers are not dangerous. Okay, if gamers were dangerous, it, we would be in a very, very bad situation because so many people are gamers. And, you know, gamers, gaming is a very large uh, sense. We have our mothers that love to play Candy Crush. They're gamers. <laughs> They're considered gamers. They're not necessarily the next breed of DDoS attackers or the ones that are going to hack and do account takeover and be the next group that's going to really be there to threaten our stability as organizations and cyber defenses. But we are seeing that attackers share a passion. They do. They share a passion for gaming. And that's something that's undeniable. And we think that something within those gaming worlds, within those gaming experiences, has built them as attackers that they are today. And it doesn't work the other way around. It's not that every gamer is an attacker. It's very, it's a very important distinction to make. It's the ones that already had those tendencies to be less legitimate that are gamers that might become attackers as a result. And I wanna um, talk a little bit about the tsunami attacks, the DDoS tsunami attacks, which uh, again, I think is a great term, but it's a new term that people might not be familiar with. Can you just um, talk a little bit about, about why they're so difficult to detect and, and mitigate ultimately? Well, that is also a very good question. And you know, to counter your question, I'll ask you that. When, you, let's say, Taylor Swift will announce her next concert, ticketing is opening at 8 p.m. on a certain date, at this moment in time, you can just imagine the amount of people that would try to reach the ticketing website to get a ticket. So we're talking millions of people. And this is what we call, as in the cybersecurity world, the term is flash crowd. So it's legitimate users that are all trying to access a service at the same time. All legitimate, nothing malicious there. But a web DDoS tsunami attacks looks exactly the same. It's one specific moment where millions of requests are trying to access a certain website. And this is where the term web DDoS tsunami comes from, because it really is like a tsunami. It's so many coming in. When we're thinking about why it's so hard to detect those, it's because it really looks the same as if Taylor Swift just opened a new, a new tour and just asked people to go online and buy tickets. It looks the same when you look at the graphs, the amount of traffic, what we've shown in the last slides in the presentation, it looks exactly like that with maybe two and a half million people trying to access every second. And that's where it became so hard to mitigate. So how do you really know when there's a flash crowd and when there is a web DDoS tsunami attack? And the way to do that is really by having behavioral mechanisms that understand the behavior of the attack. And if it is a flash crowd, they will know the way this traffic is distributed looks like legitimate traffic. They learn the traffic in what we call peacetime. So when there's no attacks, what are the usually, what is the traffic to the website? Where are they accessing from? What kind of device they use to access? What kind of browsers? And hundreds and hundreds of parameters that are learned ahead of time so that when there is a flash crowd, we say, okay, it's the same distribution that we know. It's just in massive volumes. So we know it's legitimate. But when it's attack, it's not going to behave like that. It's going to come from other sources. It's going to, traffic is going to be originating from different sources that we usually see in peacetime. This is why behavioral mitigation, behavioral detection is so important to stop web DDoS tsunami attacks. You mentioned, uh, the massive increase, I think it was 770% increase over year, uh, not year over year, but, but effectively in over the past couple of years uh, for all intents yes. and purposes. Um, where does this end? <laughs> I, 
I mean, technology is becoming more and more um, advanced, more sophisticated. Certainly AI uh, is now with us going forward. Um, other things are coming, um, obviously more powerful AI, but quantum computing, I mean, this is not a, this is not going to be a smaller problem. If we, if we grew 770% in two years, um, where do you see this going? I mean, what, what, what can we expect in terms of just the threat landscape in the next two years? So, Doug, I wish I had the exact number to tell you 2025, this will be the increase. But I think what's really important when looking ahead is understanding it's only going to grow. There are going to be new and new attack vectors that we don't know. It's going to be zero day attacks. This is what we call zero day attacks, something that is just coming out. And it's going to be even more complicated because tomorrow's zero day attack will be different then the day after tomorrow, zero day attack. AI will just generate those on a daily, if not hourly basis. It's capable of doing that, we know. And you've just mentioned quantum computing. We can just think if quantum computing becomes available to our attackers, we know how devastating this can be. And so, in my so opinion- it, so is, there, is, there, is there like a kind of a, ultimate final position to begin to start to take with regard to that? I mean, it yes. doesn't sound, it doesn't sound <laughs> pleasant. It is not pleasant, I agree, but I think the only one that is left for us as cybersecurity solutions providers and even as organizations that just want to be protected is to do everything we can to be one step ahead. If quantum computing falls under the hands of attackers, we need it to fall under our hands before it happens. If AI is what attackers are using in order to attack our infrastructures, we need to use that same AI in order to be protected. And I can tell it's already happening. We have a news, some new article, news article that came out, I think last week or two weeks ago, of researchers that really wanted to understand the vulnerabilities of their own platform. And what they did is they used AI. They asked ChatGPT to map all of the vulnerabilities that they had in their own system. And ChatGPT did a great job at that. It just listed them, the entire list of vulnerabilities that they have. If we use that under our advantage and do that before the attackers does that, we can still stay one step ahead. Ava, thanks very much for the time today. And uh, and best of luck with, with all you're doing at Radware. It's, uh... It's amazing the research that you guys are doing and the, and the insights that you're gaining around um, where attacks are coming from, the level of attacks, and, and certainly starting to project out um, where the sophistication is going to begin to uh, track. So uh, once again, thanks very much for the time today and best of luck going forward with the rest of the year. Thank you very much for having me. If your business would like to be featured in a future event, contact us today.